Hello, good morning to everyone. My name is Dr. Yang. Today's topic will be basic concept and theories of growth. Uh, so, hope you can pay attention in this topic. Okay. These are the learning outcomes. At the end of the lecture, you should be able to define the terminologies of growth, identify the factors influencing the growth and development, outline the methods of measuring growth, explain the different theories of growth, and apply the clinical application of growth and development in functional appliance. Okay, in orthodontics, there are two basic requirements. First, you have to know the basic knowledge of the anatomy and growth of the head. And secondly, you need to master the techniques for regulating the tooth position. Okay, as a dental clinician, as a dentist and as orthodontist, we should know the concept of when, where, why and how the facial growth occurs and the role of genetic and environmental factors influencing the facial growth. We also need to know how the face changes from its embryologic form through childhood, adolescent and adulthood. I think during your first year and second year, you already have uh, topics uh, for embryology uh, of the head and neck. So, might be some of the some of the information here is a revision and some of it is a new information for you to digest. So is it necessary to have a thorough understanding of both the pattern of normal growth and the mechanism that underlie it and deviation from normal pattern? It is important to distinguish normal variation from the effect of abnormal and pathologic process. So remember, you need to understand the normal growth first before you need to understand the effect of abnormal and the pathologic process. So you also need to know how the above factors can be modified by the operator for the benefit of the patient and how to achieve the optimal result in the potential of each individual person. Okay, now you need to know the definition of growth. There is some definition of growth based on the uh, dictionary and based on the person define it. So firstly, from the British Medical Dictionary, growth is a progressive development of a living being or part of an organism from its earlier stage to maturity, including the resultant increase in size. Growth is also a self-multiplication of living substance. And by more years, growth is a quantitative aspect of biological development per unit of time and Melvin Moose defined growth as change in any morphological pattern that is measurable. So now what is development? By thought, development is a progress towards maturity. And from Moyers, development is all the changes that are natural and unidirectional in life of an individual from its existence as a single cell to its elaboration as a multifunctional unit determinating in death. So what is the difference between development and growth? Growth is more to anatomical and development is more to physiological and behavioral. So now what is differentiation? Differentiation is a change from a generalized cell or tissue to one that is more specialized. Thus, differentiation is a change in quality or kind. Now, we will look into factors affecting the physical growth. First one is hereditary. Uh, hereditary may affect the size of parts, rate of growth and the onset of growth. The gene plays a major role in the overall growth of a person. For example, this patient has a class 3 mouth occlusion and then we will look uh, at his or her parents. Because of the genetic, the parents may also have a class 3 mouth occlusion. So when we look at this photo, it shows a photo of a 
Spanish dynasty, which have a class three more occlusion. They have a prognathic jaw where we call it Hamburg's jaw because their dynasty is called Hamburg dynasty and then they call it Hamburg jaw for the class three more occlusion in their family. Secondly is the nutrition. Malnutrition may affect all aspects of growth, including size of parts, body proportion, quality and texture of tissue and onset of growth event. The effect of malnutrition are reversible to a certain extent as children have five recuperative powers. Okay, when the proper nutrition is provided, the children will have a catch-up growth if only the adverse effect is not too severe. Thirdly is the illness. The usual minor childhood illness ordinarily cannot be shown to have effect on physical growth. Prolonged and debilitating illness, however, can have a marked effect on all aspects of growth. After the illness, uh, the catch-up growth will follow. Fourthly is the risk. So the growth uh, is different among different races and it also can be attributed to other nutritional and environmental factors. The next one is socio-economic factors. Children who brought out in a favorable socio-economic background show early onset of growth event. They also grow to a larger size than children living in poor socio-economic environment. Then, the family size and birth order. The smaller the family size, the better will be the nutrition and other favorable conditions. Firstborn babies tend to weigh less at birth and have smaller stature but higher IQ. So, any one of you is the firstborn? So, in this study, they said you have higher IQ. Wow. Then, secular trends. Changes in size and maturation in a large population can be shown to occur with time. It could possibly be due to changes in socio-economic condition and food habit. For example, a 15-year-old boy is approximately 5 inches taller than the same age group 50 years back. Puberty age for the current generation is much earlier compared to the previous generation. So the next one is climate and seasonal effect. Seasonal variation have been shown to affect adipose tissue content and the width of the newborn babies. Climatic changes seem to have little direct effect on rate of growth. Psychological disturbance. Children experiencing stressful conditions display a slightly reduced growth hormone. Psychological disturbance of prolonged duration can retard growth. And the last one, the factors affecting the physical growth is exercise. Exercise are essential for a healthy body. However, regular exercise have not been associated with more favorable growth. However, certain aspects of growth such as development of some motor skill and increase in muscle mass is found to be influenced by exercise. Now we will move to concepts of growth. Firstly, the concept of normality. What is normal? Normal refers to something that is typical, usually expected and is ordinarily seen. The concept of normality must not be equated with that of the ideal. While Ideal denotes the central tendency for the group. Normal refers to a range. So don't confuse normal with ideal. Normal is something typical, but ideal is something that uh, uh, better than normal. The next one is growth pattern. Pattern refers to a set of proportional relationship at a given point of time and also refers to the change in this proportional relationship over time. 
Uh, these pictures uh, is cephalocorded gradient of growth by Robbins WJ in 1928. It shows the changes in body proportion uh, from two months of fetus and four months fetus up to maturity during adulthood. Note that the large size of head in relation to the rest of the body at birth. The next one is differential growth. The human body does not grow at the same rate throughout life. Different organs grow at different rates to different amount and at a different times. So now we look at this Scammon growth curve which is created in 1930s. Uh, they have a lymphoid, neural, general and genital. So uh, focus on the neural. The neural means the central nervous system. We can see that the central nervous system is well developed at birth and grows rapidly during the early years of life, being essentially complete approximately around 10 years of age. While the reproductive organs, which is the genital, do not begin to increase in size until puberty, so around uh, 12 years old in female and around uh, 14 years old in males. Now the rhythm of growth. Human growth is not a steady and uniform process, wherein all parts of the body enlarge at the same rate and the increment of one year equal to that of the preceding or succeeding years. There seems to be a rhythm during the growth process. The first wave of growth is seen in both sex from birth to fifth or sixth years. It is most intense and rapid during the first two years. And then it follows a slower increase terminating in boys 10 to 12 years old and girls no later than 10 years. Both sets have another period of accelerating growth corresponding to adolescence. Uh, this is uh, for girls is 14 to 16 years old and for boys from 16 to 18 years old. The next one is growth spurt. There are certain periods where there is sudden acceleration of growth occurs. These periods are called growth spurt. Physiological alteration in hormonal secretion cause growth spurt. So according to the study, there are a few phases where there is a sudden alteration. First one is just before birth. Second one is one year after birth. The third one is mixed dentition growth birth. For male, is around 8 to 11 years old and for female, is 7 to 9 years old. And the most important one for the growth spurt is the pre-pubertal growth spurt. This one you need to memorize, you need to know really well. For male, is 14 to 16 years old and for female, is 11 to 13 years old. So what is the clinical significance of the pre-pubertal growth spurt? Treatment modalities such as growth modification are best performed during growth spurt. So what is the treatment modalities for growth modification? It's a functional appliance in cases uh, such as in class 2, div, div, uh, division 1, my occlusion where that patient need twin block uh, for growth modification. So the perfect timing is around pre-pubertal growth spurt. However, some studies have shown that treatment carried out during growth spurt are more stable. Uh, for example, the relapse is lesser. This graph shows the rate of growth versus the age in girls and boys. So the girls is a red line and the boys is a green line. So the first one is a growth burst at birth which is orange in color. And then the second one, the blue color, is a mixed denti dentition spurt. And the yellow one is the pre-pubertal growth spurt, which is the important one. This is the ideal time for growth mo modification treatment. For example, twin block functional appliance in a class 2, division 1 more occlusion in a class 2 skeletal base. Uh, please pay attention for the peak height velocity as well. This is the peak uh, during the... 
uh, pre-puberty growth spurt and then uh, during the deceleration phase and then it will around uh, around 16 years old for girls uh, the pink color is a post puberty growth at this time is a not a suitable time for you to start a twin block functional appliance the best time to start a twin block functional appliance is during the accelerating phase uh, around the age of uh, 11 or 12 in girls and at the age of uh, 13 to 14 in boys and then once the growth completed which is in red in color then only uh, orthodontic surgeries can be planned. Now we will move into method of measuring growth. There are several methods of uh, measuring growth, uh, such as observation approach, measurement approach, and uh, experimental approach. So now we will start with observation approach. We have three types of observation approach. The first one is longitudinal studies. The observation and measurement pertaining to growth are made on one person or a group of individuals at regular intervals over a prolonged period of time. Uh, so uh, for longitudinal studies, usually what we do is uh, we, will, uh, we will measure uh, the shoe size, uh, and then the height of the patient, the, the patient uh, for every six uh, months or during uh, annually. And then the next one is a cross-sectional studies. The observation and measurement made of different samples and studies at different period. Uh, so we will have a different group as a sample and then we will measure the uh, growth at a different period point of time so it's not annually it's not a six monthly so there will be a certain period of time and then the third one is a semi longitudinal studies this is a combination between the longitudinal and cross-sectional method the second method is measurement approach there are three types of measurement approach which is craniometry atropometry and cephalometric radiology so what is craniometry cranio means skull and metry means measurement so it's a measurement of the skull uh, anthropometry anthropo means human body and metry means measurement so this is a measurement of the human body and cephalometric radiology is uh, for example the lateral self tracing is either manually or computerized and then thirdly is a uh, experimental approach is either viral staining, radioisotope, and implant. So I will explain one by one in the next slide. So what is viral staining? In 1936, Belcher accidentally noted that bones of animals who had eaten meadow plants were stained red. So there is a dye in a meadow plant which is called alizarin and it is used for bone research. So how does it use? So it used to determine the site of growth, the direction, the duration, and the amount of growth. So beside alizarin, there are a few dyes that can be used to measure the growth, which is the acid alizarin blue, tripon blue, lead acetate, and tetracycline. Implant. So, Bjork Implant Study in 1969 is the famous study in orthodontics. So, if you're furthering your study in orthodontics, in Master of Orthodontics, Bjork Implant Study 1969 is the most famous question. Is either will come out in AC, OSCE, or VIVA. So, what they did in this study is they put a uh, tantalum metal pins in the bones, including maxilla and mandible. And after that, they will take a lateral self radiograph within a certain period of time to see the changes in the position of one bone relative to another. And then also to see the changes in external contours of individual bone. They also want to see the extent of remodeling changes and rotational pattern of jaw bones. And then the next one is a radioisotope. This is a nuclear medicine study. What they did is they used three radioisotopes, either one, 
technetium-33, calcium-45 or potassium-32, uh, they will inject the radioisotope inside uh, the bone. And then after that, uh, they will took... Uh, uh, they will took the image to see the growth of the bone. Several theories uh, have been proposed in order to explain the mechanism controlling the growth. Uh, so initially, it started with the genetic theory, and then followed by suture dominance theory, then cartilaginous theory, functional methods theory, multifactorial theory, and finally servo system theory. I will explain this theory one by one in our next slide. The first one is the genetic theory. This is the first theory that had been introduced by Brody in 1941. Brody suggested that growth is controlled by genetic influence. So meaning that uh, the growth is controlled within the chromosome. So uh, anything inside our chromosome is a uh, genetic blueprint in is already pre-planned. Secondly, is the sutural dominance theory. This theory is suggested by Win, Menin, and Sitcher in 1955. So what they suggest is the craniofacial growth occur at sutures, and they also acknowledge the genetic influence. Uh, so for example, in this photo, we can see that the pet parallel suture, which attach the fascial bone to the cranial base and skull, push the nasomaxillary complex forward to compare with mandibular growth. However, uh, there is some point unfavorable to this theory. The transplantation of sutures to another site shows that there was no innate growth potential. And secondly, the growth take place in untreated cases of cleft palate, even in the absence of sutures. And then in 1953, James Scott suggests another theory, which is cartilaginous theory. In this theory, uh, Scott suggests that cartilage is the primary, primary growth centers and the role of periosteum and sutures are only secondary. The cartilage will later will be, will be placed, replaced by bone. However, experimental removal of nasal septum cartilage gives rise to retarded mid-phase development. And therefore, in Gilhaus and Moore in Scandinavia uh, did a study and it shows that 80% of the children have normal growth in spite of condylar fracture. And then uh, this gives rise to functional matrix theory, which is suggested by Melvin Moss in 1960. What Moss said is the origin form, position, growth, and maintenance of all skeletal tissue is always a secondary, compensatory, and necessary response to prior events that occur in specifically related non-skeletal tissue, organ, or functional spaces. So for the functional matrix theory, uh, there is no genetic blueprint, so it's not related to genetic and it mainly epigenetics. Uh, another scientist, Van der Klaus, suggested there are different functional cranial components in craniofunctional skeletal, each one carrying out specific functions like respiration, speech, vision, chewing, digestion, swallowing speech, and neural integration. Most suggest that the head simply represents a region where a number of specific functions occur, each being carried out by a functional cranial component. The functional cranial component consists of two elements, which is the skeletal unit and the functional matrix. Uh, the skeletal units are all the bones, cartilage and tendon that support this function, whereby the functional matrix represents all the tissue, organ and spaces that perform a given function. There are two types of uh, functional matrix, which is the periosteal matrices and capsular matrices. The periosteal matrix consists of the soft tissue related to the skeletal unit, such as muscle and tendon, while capsular matrices are the organ and tissue spaces associated with specific region within the skull, such as neurocranium, orbit, and oropharynx. Okay, this is what I explained in the previous slide. The functional cranial component uh, can be divided into two units, which is skeletal unit and functional matrix. Uh, skeletal unit 
are further subdivided into microskeletal unit and macroskeletal unit, whereby the functional matrix are divided into two, two types, which is the periosteal matrix and capsular matrix. So what is macroskeletal? Macroskeletal is when a joining portion of a number of neighboring bones are united to function as a single cranial components. For example, the endo endocranial surface of calvaria and mandible. What is microskeletal? Microskeletal is a bone is made up of number of individual skeletal unit. For example, mandible is made up by alveolar, angular process, coronal process, condylar process, and basal bone. Periosteal matrix is in non is non skeletal functional units adjacent to skeletal units, for example, muscle, blood vessel, nerves, and teeth. Capsular matrix is, is the envelopes around the face. It consists of organs and the functioning spaces, for example, the neurocranial capsule, orofacial capsule, orbital capsule, and otic capsule. Periosteal matrix acts directly and actively upon microskeletal unit. Uh, therefore, they can alter their functional demands and produce an active growth or transformation of the size and shape in their skeletal unit. Capsular matrix acts upon macroskeletal units. It produces a passive growth or translation of the size and shape of their skeletal unit. In summary, this is how microskeletal unit and macroskeletal unit reacts in order to produce growth. A multifactorial theory was performed in 1970 by Van Limburg. According to him, the factors explained by all previous theories were insufficient yet contain elements that cannot be denied. Van Limber explained the growth process in a view that combines all three existing theories. He suggested five factors that he believed to control the growth. The five factors are intrinsic genetic, local epigenetic, general epigenetic, local environmental and general environmental. So for the Intrinsic genetic factors, they are the genetic controls of skeletal unit themselves. For the local epigenetic factors, the bone growth is determined by genetic control originating from adjacent structures like brain and eyes. For the general epigenetic factors, they are the genetic factors determining growth from distant structures, for example, the growth hormone and the sore hormone. For the local environmental factors, there are non-genetic factors from local area such as habit, muscle force, and so forth. For the general environmental factors, there are general non-genetic factors influencing growth which include nutrition and oxygen. The view expressed by Van Limuth can be summarized as Chondrocranial growth is mainly controlled by intrinsic genetic factors. Dimensional growth is controlled by any few intrinsic genetic factors. Cartilaginous part should be considered as a growth center. Sutural growth is controlled mainly by influences arising from skull cartilage and other adjacent skull structures. And periosteal growth largely depends upon growth of adjacent structures. Sutural and periosteal growth are additionally governed by local non-genetic environmental influences. Thus, a variety of factors other than genetic factors as a major determinant play important role in basic growth in development. The next one is the expanding principle by N-law. Most facial bones have V-shaped 
configuration, deposition occurs on the inner side of V and resorption occurs on the opposite outer surface of V. For example, in the mandible, we can see that at the inner side there is a deposition of bone and resorption occurs at the outer surface of the mandible, thus enhance the growth of the mandible. The next one is the counterpart principle by N. Law. The growth of facial and cranial parts specifically relates to the other structural and geometrical counterparts in face and cranium. For the maxilla, the counterpart is the mandible, and for the nasomaxillary complex, the counterpart is anterior cranial fossa. The part and counterparts enlarge in the same rate and it will create balance in the occlusal relationship. However, if the parts and counterparts enlarge in the different rate, it will cause imbalance and later it will cause more occlusion. The next one is the servo system theory. This theory provides a cybernetic model of craniofacial growth which is based upon established biological principle concerning growth and function of primary and secondary cartilage and including the sutures. So, Alexandra Petrovic proposed that two principal factors determine growth of the craniofacial region. The first one is the primary cartilage. The growth of the primary cartilage within the cranial base and the nasal Stepton will determine the growth of the mid face and provide a constantly changing reference input, which is mediated via a dental occlusion. Secondly, the secondary cartilage. The secondary cartilage is mainly in the mandible. The mandible is able to respond to this changing occlusal reference by muscular adaptation and locally induced condylar growth. So what happened in the servo system theory, the cybernetic language is when there is one input and then there will be an output based on the input. So once there is a release of the hormone, this hormone is a command and then it will act as, a, as an input to the maxilla and the mandible. So the maxilla and the mandible will process this input and then the output will be in the occlusion. So, if the growth of the maxilla and the mandible is in a balanced state, and the occlusion will be good, but when the the growth of the maxilla and mandible is imbalanced, and the occlusion will not be good, will not be ideal. So, there is what servo system theory is. Now, is the clinical application of growth and development in functional appliance. So, functional appliance is an appliance used in a growth modification treatment in a class 2 skeletal base. Once we put a functional appliance in a patient, we will force the mandible to move forward. And then once we force the mandible to move forward, we will influence the muscle and the muscle will get tense. And then this muscle will release a signal. So, what happened is the action of some muscle, so for example, action of temporalis muscle will influence the coronal process. And then the masseter and medial pterygoid muscle will act upon mandibular angle and ramus. Lateral pterygoid has some influence on condylar process and functioning of related tongue and perioral muscle and expansion of the oral and pharyngeal cavities will provide stimuli for mandibular growth to reach its potential, full potential. Now, I uh, will revise again on the growth, growth part. So, when you want to do a functional appliance uh, as a growth modification treatment for patient in class 2 skeletal base, you need to know what is the perfect timing of the treatment. So, focus on the yellow part of the graph. So, the yellow part of the graph is the ideal timing for growth modification treatment. So, uh, why this is becoming the ideal time for the growth mod modification? At this time, we call a pre pubertal growth spurt. So, the perfect timing, part timing is during the accelerating phase uh, of the growth hormone. And then once the accelerating phase reach the peak heart velocity and then 
uh, the growth hormone will have a decelerating phase. And then once uh, the patient re uh, reach the decelerating phase, and then the effect of the growth modification will be reduced. So you need to know the timing. For girls, it's around 11 to 14. And for boys, it's around uh, 13 to 15 years old. Okay, as a recap, you need to ask yourself, would you able to define the terminologies of growth? Can you identify the factors influencing the growth and development? Can you outline the method of measuring growth? Can you explain the different theories of growth? And then can you apply the clinical application of growth and development in functional appliance? Uh, as an additional reading, this is the books that you can read. Uh, the I think uh, I will recommend, you, you still need to read your textbook. And then this is uh, for additional reading. I will recommend Introduction to Orthodontics by Laura Mitchell, the one in the purple color here. And then secondly, if you want to be more detailed, you can read a Handbook of Orthodontics by Martin Corbett. And then, uh, William Profit Contemporary Orthodontics is quite complicated for you. Maybe this one you read once you have read the textbook and the other orthodontic books. This is the last book that you will read, the Contemporary Orthodontics. And then for the orthodontic at a glass, this is uh, just for revision. It's a simplified notes uh, about orthodontics. Okay, I think uh, that's all for my lecture if you have any question as usual you can email me or you can uh, meet me every friday i will be around in pidc every friday all right thank you so much and have a nice day